Hey guys, Lucas from Export here. Today we're going to explore Hamamatsucho on this beautiful sunny day. You can see there's Tokyo Tower there behind me. And with me today I have the Nikon 24 to 120 f4 for Z mount, which I've never used before. I borrowed this from someone and it's my very first time using it. Now I have used the old F mount version of this lens, but I haven't used this one, so we'll see how it stacks up. Of course, I want to thank everybody who supported us on Patreon for all your you know, support. We really appreciate it. And if you haven't looked at our Patreon, please consider checking it out. You get a couple perks. If you do, like you can watch these videos early and ad free. Anyway, let's get on to the video. I explore. All right, so here we are. We've moved over uh, one foot <laughs> to this position because I want to shoot here with, with this uh, beautiful scene where you got this gate to the temple and took a tower in the background. And I should turn my camera on first. That's an important first step. And we'll just get started with a nice simple shot of the temple. Or, yeah, not the temple, but the gate to the temple. And then Tokyo Tower up there. Very nice. Simple, but effective. Kind of an iconic Tokyo shot. I like the first one I just noticed as I was looking through the viewfinder, a cool detail. I have the uh, crossing signal light in the frame. And when it's green, you know, it's fine. But when it's red, it's better because it matches the tower and the gate a little bit. All right, so let's wait for it to turn red. Then I'll shoot it again. For now, I'll just mention my settings. I'm on F8, an auto uh, uh, aperture mode, and auto ISO, which is my standard way of shooting. So in the daytime, my settings are very simple, very little fiddling I have to do with the settings because the camera generally handles things very well and uh, things look good. So F8, simple, just to get everything really nice and sharp. Okay, here we go. It's going to change. Awesome. So we're going to go over there and uh, take a look around. There's a couple cool things we can shoot. I already see something, a little hint of something. There are these cranes that are peeking out from behind the building back there. I think that'll be a nice juxtaposition with the tower. And a nice showcase of this 24 to 120 lens because I have all this zoom, right? So I want to use that to get some tight shots of the upper parts of the Tokyo Tower back there. All right, here we go. We'll be from about here. Zoom all the way in. That's awesome. It's really amazing to see this like giant piece of steel going up into the air on this crane so effortlessly. In focus, all good. Settings were good. All right, we'll continue on. We'll do some more streety kind of stuff. And then as we head that way, there's like an architectural area with a lot of cool skyscrapers and whatnot, and we'll shoot there as well. I think w when I have, or when I'm shooting that kind of place, I like to have a lens like this because sometimes you want to go wide to get, you know, the whole like architectural scene, but sometimes I want to close up on the details high up in the buildings or use the, um, a distant perspective to get that compression effect that people talk about and when you're far away to get the compression you obviously want to zoom in then to show the details that you're compressing by standing far away but more on that later so over here there's this cool uh, street which in Japanese we would call a shotengai like a shopping street or commercial street and it's obviously pretty pretty quiet right now in the morning it's like 10 a.m. or something like that just looking around before we go in. But I want to head in there. I want to explore. Let's see what it looks like. This is obviously the kind of place that gets busier at night. But I do like the, the feel in, in a place like this, even in the daytime. Let's get a simple shot like this. Yeah, and then, I mean, like, I was talking about compression just now, and there's a lot of you know, confusion about that. People say, oh, then long lenses do compression. And I just did that with this photo. I did a wider one. Let's actually see how many millimeters it was. The first one was on 40 millimeter. In fact, let me demonstrate that really clearly. If I'm going to talk about it, I should make a really good demonstration. So I'm just going to do a wide shot. Right? And then I'm going to do a long shot. Which is very ugly because there's nothing interesting about the long shot down there. Maybe we'll have better examples later that are more aesthetically pleasing. But the point is, as I just demonstrated, by zooming in, you can see that the, the longer shot is compressed. Everything looks kind of flat compared to the wide shot where you have this 
why you know things on the edges look more we say distorted but they're not really distorted um, anyway but that has nothing to do with the focal length and everything to do with the perspective it's just that if even with my naked eye the stuff way down there looks compressed because I'm looking at it from far away so the relative distances between objects in terms of the distance away from me is very similar like that car and the next car are both really far from me they're not pretty far from each other but they're way farther from me than they are from each other that's what causes the compression the zoom lens just lets you crop in onto those things far away and it lets you blow up that compression effect and show it full frame but the wide angle shot has that same effect in there anyway I've talked about this in a video all about this specific thing but I it's like I we, it's a battle we have to constantly fight against this misinformation because people post online this example I'm sure you've seen it of like the lens zooming in and out and like someone's face getting distorted and that's just not the full story it's very misleading so I figured I might as well talk about it here a little bit but in terms of actually shooting here I think this view is better because now we can actually see the little entrance way like um, think of a jigger a little gate the taxi go and that's an okay scene nothing amazing honestly the guy standing there is kind of cool let's keep going um, turn off my spirit level I had that on in the viewfinder and it was distracting I don't really mind if the photos are not perfectly level right up this minute okay So, oh wow, so I know this area fairly well, but not that great. So I'm surprised to find this. And here is a good example of this compression. Let's talk about compression here, because the example photos I just showed, I might not have even showed them, because they might have been, well, maybe I did, because they have to illustrate the point. But this is a better example. So you see, I'm standing far away from that temple, and I'm going to zoom in all the way, and it's going to have this compressed effect where the stairs, although those stairs have a lot of depth, they look actually quite flat because we're so far away but we're going to get a little closer and as I get closer and then shoot with a wider focal length they're going to look less flat right but they're going to look less flat because I'm using a wider focal length or sorry because I'm closer not because I'm using a wider focal length that was a brain fart you see it's you and I said it wrong <laughs> it's easy to get confused about these things all right I might even do an intermediary one here. So now I might not need 120 millimeter. I'm still going to do 120 millimeter. Oh, and there's this guy on the stairs, the, the priest. Too bad about the other guy squatting in front of it to take a photo. But oh well, he's just doing what I'm doing, no big deal. Okay. So yeah, I'm not trying to be very scientific in illustrating this compression concept to you guys right now because, um, what do you call it? This is a, we already made a video about that, like specifically. So I'm being very casual about it, but this is the thing, this is the real world application, right? It's not, I'm not trying to be like, I'm not gonna show you every distance at every focal length. It's not what this video is really about. Yeah. Okay. And so you see now we are close and I'm still gonna zoom in. Not as much, because if I zoom into 120, but here's the thing, I could zoom into 120 and show you the, the stairs. Obviously, I see less of them. That's actually a cool shot with the person up there bowing. Beautiful. Wow, lovely. Oh, wow, here we go. He's going to go up the side a little bit. They never go up the middle, I noticed. Nobody's talking to him. That's pretty cool. I like this conversation they're having. Interesting. All right. So yeah, real world application of these concepts. So it's going to be hard to compare. Like I said, I'm not being scientific, but if you look carefully at the photo from farther away, even at the same 120 millimeters, in both cases, I'm pretty sure I shot them both fully zoomed in. The stairs look a little different from here. I can see the top of some of the steps right so they, they don't look completely like a two-dimensional surface 
But when we were all the way back down the street, it really looked like a flat kind of plane of just lines because we looked compressed. And that was because we were far away. I know I'm really beating this home, but like, or whatever, beating the dead horse, you know what I mean. But it's important because this is the thing that people get confused about a lot, I think. Now, as always, I don't want to go all the way up in there because I don't want to disturb people. So we're just going to go off to the side here, but taking one last look. Mm. Yeah, let's keep, let's keep going. On, on my own, and if you ever come to Tokyo on your own, go in the temple. Take photos. I, I encourage it. It's totally fine. I don't think anyone have an issue. As long as you're respectful, you're not like, you know, causing a disturbance. But when we shoot these videos, I'm always a little bit like, ah, you know, because I'm talking to a camera and there's Axel running around with the gimbal and I don't know. I don't want to disturb people. It is a place where they're doing a religious activity, so let's not be jerks. But anyway, we're going to loop around here and make our way towards that architectural area that I mentioned. So now we're back by the, uh, the train station, by Hamamatsucho station. And already there's some cool stuff here. In fact, I love how the sun is just behind those buildings and so it creates these dramatic kind of contrast up here. Which again, the uh, and then the zoom lens here is useful because I can just zoom in and just get like this very abstract view. I'm actually turning the camera quite a bit to create this angle. And when I'm shooting architecture, I like to do these kind of like close-ups of, of just parts of the of the building to create this kind of abstraction. I think it's pretty cool. Or even something like what I'm doing for this shot. So there's I'm not getting the sky at all, just the two buildings and how they sort of meet. There's also the reflection of a crane in the far building over there. So yeah, the, the beauty of a long lens like this is all these little details you can get. I'm going to move over a little bit. Maybe just get the whole scene again. I didn't do a wide shot yet. Just go all the way wide. And just get these two buildings. Now this is a very simplistic photo. But it looks pretty cool, just because of the good light. Hmm. It goes to show you that good light can make a photo, right? A dramatic photo, even if the scene is nothing especially, you know, unique or, or amazing. Let's go across here. Well, let's do one more quick compression shot. I was talking about compression. Well, let's get that temple down there with all the... Now, I wonder if it's the light's still green. It is. <laughs> But yeah, nice long shot down the road with these stripes in the foreground. I'm going to come over here a little bit. I want to be like just in the shade. Hmm. Here we go. We can get a little foreground element. It's a... Uh, Okay, we'll move on. Let's keep going. I could take a minute here to mention the lens a little bit. Um, so far, it feels great. I mean, it's nice to use. Everything's nice. The photos, like I said, I, it's my first time using it, so I'm not seeing them. I'm only seeing them on the camera, but they do look super, super sharp. Of course, I'm at f8, so most lenses, I mean, you're going to expect plenty of sharpness at f8. I do want to make another video at some point about this uh, lens at night. We didn't have time this time because it's just we just had a chance to shoot in the morning, so we're doing it in the morning. But I want to use this lens at night because I, I feel like f4 is a little bit underrated for shooting at night, especially in the day and age of IBIS. But that's a different topic for another day. And um, I will just say that one interesting thing, or like, I don't know, sort of, not interesting, but like the thing that caught me, caught my attention right away, is that the zoom ring is quite stiff stiffer than my other Nikon lenses so but it's not a bad thing it's just like a little bit weird it takes some getting used to that might be good because I remember on the old 24 to 120 if you held it like this I believe it would slide out a little bit this one doesn't so maybe that's why they stiffened it up which is cool all right ooh, some cool shadows here like this so the Sun is um, you know shining between these these rail uh, bridges creating these interesting angular shadows and then all the stripes and everything and 
something to the frame. Now we just need a nice silhouette to walk through them. I realize we won't get a silhouette from here. Okay, let's move actually because if the person stands in the light, there won't be a silhouette. So I need to shoot them like from the side. Yeah. Mm hmm. Right. Interesting. Okay. It's going to be tricky to get a silhouette, I realize, but we will get one, I think. I just need to get the right angle. for the person to be a silhouette they need to be out of the light right? they need to be in the shade because like right now see I'm going to do a photo of these people with this blue arrow right but as they step out of the light that's when they become silhouettes of course right so to get but to get them out of the light but the arrow behind them I need to shoot from the side not from in front of it right that sounds really obvious as I say it, but it didn't occur to me right away as I rolled up on the scene. So yeah, the more of an angle I use, the better. And this is again where the long lens really helps. There we go. Yeah. Okay, and when a good person comes out, I'll, I'll, I'll take a series of photos and, I, and I'll illustrate the point. You know, you'll see as I, you might be able to see it on video, but it's quite far away, so I don't know if it's coming up. But definitely in my photo here. All right, so we're silhouette, silhouette. Well, that guy was a silhouette longer because he was, he was um, away from the wall. So that also changes things a little bit. Now the other hard part is, okay, I'm getting my silhouettes like I want. But am I getting a composition that makes sense to emphasize this cool little arrow thing? You see, this guy is in the light, and then in the last moment, he goes in the shadow, and he becomes a silhouette. But then he's not quite in the right position in the frame. So what I need is people to be away from the wall. Now, before we move on, one more thing I want to do, because I have a similar shot to this that I took a few weeks ago, with also a telephoto lens. It's not this one, I use my 70-200. I'll probably put that shot up, because I quite like that shot, and it's very similar to this in like the conditions that I shot it in. I shot it across the street, under the overpass. And in that one, I had something in the foreground. And here we have something in the foreground too. It happens to actually be the same color. So maybe this will spice up the image a little bit. Maybe I'll use the other side. If I put in uh, this yellow object into the frame, just to kind of make it a little more, I don't know, give it something so that it's not just the blue arrow only hard part will be maybe that it's um, not the right exposure you know yeah okay I'm also gonna back up a bit although I'm gonna be in the way for the people I'm backing up because I don't want to be too close to this yellow uh, pillar because the closer I get the more out of focus it is and I don't want it to actually be that out of focus I want it to be pretty defined okay I'm pretty happy with this overall now I just need the right people there's a little group group is too messy I think I always want one like this guy there we go like oh here's the guy with the hat hats are always awesome he's uh, quite slow all right we're gonna just observe Yeah, he should be coming into frame now, any moment. Oh, come on, oh, come on. Ah, oh, and somebody else showed up in the same time. Man, I'm gonna go one more, just a single, single person. That guy was pretty cool, he's on his phone. This lady. By the way, I'm on a 500th, which the camera's choosing automatically because it's just that bright here. But if I, if it wasn't, like if, because uh, my minimum shutter speed for 
aperture mode plus auto ISO is 250 so the camera will keep it on 250 as much as possible but for this kind of shot I would I would switch it to M and put it on 500 myself because I want to make sure these silhouettes are tack sharp and because they're moving ever so slightly then um, you know 250 might not be enough anyway we'll keep we'll keep going I think it's time to move on I shot a lot of photos of that and we'll get across the street here and go into the skyscraper skyscrapery area more skyscrapers and shoot some of that all right let's go in the midst of these buildings here now the trees are starting to have some foliage but I, I i like coming here in the winter when the trees are bare they make a nice kind of juxtaposition the brown trees with the bluish kind of environment bluish grayish it's very monochromatic not monochromatic but low in color but now it's getting green whatever we'll work with that now one of the key elements that i like here is the um the track of the Yurika Mome, which is this like automated train. People say it's a monorail, but it's, actually it's not a monorail. It's, it's got like rubber uh, tires, but it's on the track. It's an unmanned train and it goes from Shinbashi Station out to Odaiba, which is the artificial island, the reclaimed land that's in the Tokyo Bay. And along the way, its track kind of snakes between these skyscrapers and buildings around here. And I like that. There's this nice curve to it over here right here and I, I wanted to shoot this I have some photos of this I've taken before on a different lens but today we'll shoot it with this one and again for this kind of stuff having a telephoto lens is useful because I want to I want to keep the perspective here I don't want to get closer if I get closer the perspective won't won't work all right at least not the same way beautiful simple but beautiful a little underexposed but we'll fix that in post Let's see here and these trees are still bare so this is what i was saying like in the winter i like how although the light is not great on the tree right now but i like how these trees just create these like textures and then the buildings and the other things kind of create the environment for them here's the train itself going by up there Maybe we'll get a, a different perspective that will allow me to get a, get a shot of the train. Now there's a particular shot here that I really like, that I'm totally stealing from myself <laughs> before. Like earlier this, or not this year, last year in 2021 I kind of noticed this. But if you stand here, you can see through this curvy you know space that's created by the track you can see that building back there and i like that that's very satisfying how it's just it just fits right in there and again this is a good example of how the perspective cannot change i can't you know if i have a different focal length again like for example a wider one well i'd have to get closer well if i get closer the building won't be so snug in fact i'll, I'll do that let me let me get i'm gonna get a perfect shot here i haven't quite you know, nailed it. I'm going to do a, a couple. Maybe I'll do a wider one that gets the whole uh, track. But the point is, by zooming, I'm just getting more or less stuff in the frame. So right now I'm doing a wide shot, getting the entire outside of the track. But now I'm going to zoom in. And this is the, the shot I just did initially. And I'm just going to get the inside of the curve of the track with the building. But the perspective is exactly the same. Just the uh, framing has changed because I was able to you know, crop it or uncrop it. And I like the tighter one more, I think it's much cleaner. But now if I actually move, like if I move back, well that doesn't work because the building starts to not fit into that space, right? So I'm gonna take this photo, I mean it still looks pretty cool, but it's not as satisfying to me because by moving back, I've made the building, basically the train tracks are closer to me than the building is so as i move back the building gets smaller more slowly than the bridge the bridge gets smaller more quickly which means the apparent opening of that hole with you know where I'm, that i'm shooting through gets smaller faster than the building so the building looks like it doesn't fit anymore right now i'm gonna get 
more forward. I'm going to go closer than I was initially. Oh, there's the train. That might have been a cool shot, but that's okay. And as I get more forward, so imagine if I didn't have the, the zoom lens, if I had only a 24 millimeter lens, I might want to come all the way here to shoot it. And it's still really wide, by the way. But if I shoot it from here, yeah, the building fits into the gap, but it's not quite as satisfying because there's a lot of space around it. Like it fits too loosely. I like the initial composition because it fit like just right. It looked like it was made for that gap. So again, I'm saying kind of obvious stuff like perspective matters, exactly where you stand really matters for your composition. But I'm just want to draw the illustration that that's the beauty of a zoom lens. The zoom lens like this, a very versatile 24 to 120, what, this, what I think of this lens as is this is the free pass. This is the you can stand wherever you want lens. Okay, I can stand there if I want to, if I want to be farther I can be, because when I stand in those positions, then after the fact I can crop by zooming to the framing that I want. So I don't get too much or too little of what I'm seeing. I can be totally free in my perspective. And that's what I talked about in the perspective video, but I'm reiterating it because this is the fundamental to photography and it's something a lot of people miss, I feel, or they, at least they're not so conscious of it when it comes to very long zoom lenses like this or even more limited zoom lenses like a 24 to 70 or something. Um, it's first you should choose your perspective where you want to stand and then you choose the framing by zooming with the lens. It's not always that simple, but that's kind of how I think about it. So I'm going to go, I'm going to back up a little bit more and do another one of the ones where the building is snug because I realized my initial one, maybe it was a little too snug. I want to give it a little bit more breathing room and then this will be the last shot of this scene. Let's go up on this walkway. Maybe we'll get a bullet train or something from, from above if we can get a clear shot of it. Let me see here. I just want to see maybe I can just take a nice long shot, but it's pretty... Mm, I mean, it's, it's bland, but it does look kind of epic, those buildings over there. And again, per perspective, you see, so like, I, was, I just thought to myself, hey, I want to get the bridge with the building. So to do that, I have to go back. I have to move away because the bridge will get smaller and, and lower, apparently, to the buildings. And now, as I keep stepping back from about here, now the, the bridge is like right on top of the buildings. And then I can frame it really tight. And I like that. This is the end of the video almost, and I feel like I'm getting to actually something super interesting. Well, at least to me it is, but that's another compositional uh, concept that I should highlight. It's what I was doing with the shot just before. This idea of getting the building just snugly into the space, and what I did as well now with the bridge above the buildings. To me, I, I, don't, I didn't coin this, I read this somewhere a long time ago, but this creates in photography what we call tension. So when two objects in a frame, in an image, are like almost touching, like the closer they get to each other before they touch, it creates this odd tension. Once they actually overlap, then it creates a different effect. I forget the name of it, but it's a, it's a different like a visual psychology effect where like the, something about the, them overlapping. But before they touch, there's this tension. And I like creating that kind of tension in, in architectural scenes like this, especially with elements that are not actually ever going to touch. The bridge and the buildings are nowhere near each other. But in the frame they are, and that creates an interesting effect, and it makes the photo a little bit more interesting to me. And again, perspective is key for that because you have to stand in a particular place. And then a zoom lens like this gives me that versatility, and that's kind of how I like to use these lenses. All right. Guys, on that note, I think we're going to wrap this video up because uh, we've covered a lot. Um, and I think from here, it's going to be a long walk to the next interesting thing, which would be Shio Dome down there that I already mentioned. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you found it interesting, my little, not even review, just an excursion with a 24 to 120. Um, I like it. <laughs> I have to give it back, but I do like it. I do have other lenses that cover this zoom range, so I probably won't be getting one of these myself. But if you want something that... Um, you know, covers a, a broad zoom range, is, is, is versatile and effective, I, I, rec I can recommend this. Again, I haven't looked at the photos yet, but I'm confident they're going to be sharp. I will certainly make another video about this, though, at night one day, because I want to talk about the value of f4 at night. I think people feel like they must have a 2.8 or greater lens at night, and I've used an f4 lens like, you know, the old f-mount version of this at night with a great effect. So, of course, it limits 
how much light you can take in, but it's still very useful. But that'll be another video. All right, so thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, please, you know, support us on Patreon if you like this video. You do get them uh, early and ad free, and at the higher tiers, you get access to our map of Tokyo photo spots, which includes some of the things I talked about today, in fact. And um, of course, if you're interested in the lens, check out the referral link in the description below. And if you click on it and buy it, that helps us out as well, and you get a lens. And anyway, thank you so much for watching to the very end. And remember, always challenge your eye.